Welcome back to New Covenant. We are dealing with saving faith. I originally had it saving or unsaving, but it's saving belief, saving faith. That will be the big five, five aspects to faith. And we're on number three, which is saving faith. This should be video. I don't know. Uh, I'll, I, I re-enumerate these, so I apologize, but uh, it should be five... Three, four. Let's get going. Uh, this is a busy day, a lot of work already today. Uh, and this is Jeremiah with New Covenant. We greet you in the only name given amongst men. There's only one name given, and that is, uh, of course, Playlist 52. And as we go along, I'm going to introduce uh, to you more and more playlists and references to playlists so that you can begin to hammer home, those of you who have been following and you who are subscribers, you can enjoy compartmentalizing and putting things in every subject where it belongs. Obviously, for those of you who thought about this, Sound Doctrine is going to be big. I, sound Doctrine is going to be bigger than I ever wished it would be. So, uh, But that's the way it's going to have to be because I don't want too many categories and Sound Doctrine is going to have uh, at least 24, at least 12 right off the bat uh, subjects. So, like a paragraph heading. Uh, so, uh, that's just the way it has to be. I, I don't want too many... Uh, um, I, like the, I like the idea of limiting to 52 at this time. I'm going, we're going to limit the playlist of 52. Now, and then there are going to be some subjects that when you scroll through my playlist, you're going to see a bazillion uh, playlist. However, it, it's not endless, and it's going to take a little work. We like to make everything a one-button, push-button thing, but we can't do that all the time. And, uh, and uh, I don't mind working a little, but sometimes I'm not in the mood for working. I'm not in the mood for scrolling through dozens of available videos, but that's just something that uh, is going to have to happen. Uh, I don't know how I'm going to do this, uh, perform these, uh, this web page and so forth on Odyssey because I'm pretty close to getting into Odyssey and so forth using that format. Well, let's, get, let's get going. Uh, we're, in, we're, we're talking about confidence in things that you don't fully understand, and uh, that's what faith is, and, uh, and the subject right now is having confidence in something that you don't fully know or understand, such as you don't you don't see Father, but you but you you know He's there. So that's the point. So you're here to to learn how to put your confidence in things that you really don't see. You you don't know how it's going to happen, and you don't necessarily understand how it's going to happen. Uh, the Bible says that the the Lord spoke everything into existence from nothing. Well, we believe that, and it's not that hard to, to put your confidence in that. It's, it's reasonable. You know, some people say that what, we, what, what I or what you may believe in is unreasonable. Well, in, in, in some ways, in many ways, they're entitled to their opinion. But, but they, they have a right to be wrong. Let's put it that way. I used to tell uh, my many years of college, I, I told a lot of the professors, taking a lot of philosophy courses and so forth, and uh, where the professor could basically teach almost anything they want to teach and say, this is real, that's real. I told him, that you're basically entitled to your opinion, and I'm here to learn and to uh, be an evangelist. You know, I'm Daniel in the lion's den here, and, and I don't mind being in the lion's den, uh, attending some secular um, universities. I, I attended quite a few secular universities. Didn't bother me. I would have preferred belonging to some uh, university with all Christians in Malibu Beach, uh, like William Penn wanted or something, but uh, that's not necessarily uh, the call of a Christian. You're called to war. You're called to a battle. And that battle is a battlefield. But we won't go into that right now. So let's get going as we get into, uh, by the way, war is going to be 24. If you, want to, if you want to learn what kind of war you're in, what kind of battle this is, all you have to do is click on Playlist 24. If it's not there, it's being revised. There's a lot of revision going on, okay? 
in 2022. We're, we are revising. I am working, and it's good. It's good to be a workman. Okay, Paul said, a workman. Okay, we got a lot of work to do, and it's good. It's good to stay busy. In the evenings, I have a little bit of time, but even then, I find myself trying to catch up with this uh, wonderful honey in the word of the living God. Let's get into what is uh, saving belief. What, what is saving belief? And what is unsaving belief? Now, we left off on Matthew 13, 3, and uh, we're going to talk about more examples of what is saving and what is not saving. What's the criteria? What are the demands? What do you have to agree with? Because Christianity is essentially a new agreement. You're getting new data, you're getting new information, and you're going to have to agree with that new information. And it's not, it's not difficult to agree with the new information. If you have an open, loving, caring heart, you're going to take in all of these thought processes and all these engagements of knowledge, and you're not going to be offended in it. Because you're not going to produce... You're not going to put up a wall of pride uh, to the truth, which is very, very unfortunate for people who do that. Now, a lot of people recover from that, but we don't. We surely, we most surely don't want you to disagree and to not put confidence in reality in the Bible. The Bible is reality, and for, and for you to resist it is it could cost you heavily. It's my job to try to dissuade people from that position into agreeing with the truth and the demands of your cognitive mind to go ahead and engage the truth and embrace it and not be offended. Okay? I already went over that. I decided to go over that again before I take a break here. Um, and, of course, that is demands on your thinking and demands on the mindset you have pertaining to having perfect submission. The word perfect means complete or sufficient. If you walk through a church and you say, I, I submitted, that's called professed subjection. Okay? What's demanded of you is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart. And so that, that, that's, a, that's a high calling. Okay? There's a lot involved. There's work. There's discipline. There's emotion. Uh, the Christian life is not a boring life. Let, let's get going. Uh, now, I'm on uh, thir Matthew 13, 3. Now, before we go there... I want to take a break. I want to take a break and get into some of the, the heart the heart matters, the, the, the core matters here. What happens to a lot of people when they have Bible study? They, they, they get lost on the core values. In other words, what I just told you about faith, saving faith and comparing uh, different types of beliefs and, and belief systems and, and uh, people who have confidence that's, that's not the proper confidence. You have to have the proper confidence. I've already talked about uh, the two periods of confidence and so forth, and uh, I'll talk about that some more. But some of you can get lost in all of this, uh, the smoke here. You, you can get yourself uh, in, 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 a, in a pretzel, and I'm here to help you with that. that and, and, one, and one way to, to do that is to always go back to basics periodically. Let, let, let's go back to more basics again so that you get... You get the foundation of where we're going with all this. In other words, a lot of this faith knowledge, it, it, it has a goal. Uh, this, this information about Christian faith, be it saving or unsaving, it, 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 the saving belief has a goal. And the goal is not saving faith. That's the point. The saving faith is a ladder. And when you get to heaven, you're going to throw the ladder away. Faith is a ladder you're going to toss. That means that we're not going to get too excited about this. We're excited. It's our path to pleasing God and salvation. But that path is going to be, the ladder is going to be kicked to the curb. Because the only thing that, that, that you're going to have when you get to the, to the, to the goal of faith is love, and you're, you're going to kick faith away. The ladder's gone. Why? Because you wanted to get to love. That's what that, that's what you were. That's that's where you were headed. To love and intelligence. That that was your goal. Your goal was not to to savor in confidence. 
I've seen on TV, I hear a lot of young Bible teachers, they, they, they mention faith, and they, they talk about faith as though it's something permanent and something that is the goal. Our goal is faith. That is not the goal of Christianity. The goal of Christianity is for you to put on a circumcised, caring heart and to seek the truth. That's your goal. And to own the truth. That's your everlasting portion. The, the, the thing that you drink right now that's not going anywhere. I drink love right now and I drink faith. But I'm not going to drink faith in the rapture anymore. It's gone. And some people have told me, oh, you're, you're belittling faith because we're, we're heavy into faith over here. Well, listen, if you're heavy into faith, I'm sorry to hear that because Christianity is supposed to be faith, hope, and love, and, and it sounds to me like you're uh, flunking the class. You're flunking the class because you can't keep track of three items. Okay, you, you can't keep track of three items, faith, hope, and love, which is the next segment of this lesson, 5.4. On the playlist number 5 here, 5.4 is faith, hope, and love. And we're going to identify all three of these components to the basic uh, structure of Christianity. That's what it is. When I talk to people, I can tell that they're not, they're not that much interested in love. They may or may not be, and I'm not making any determinations about that. I'm just saying that's my impression. You get my point? I'm not here to, to analyze people. You know. No, it's just that you know, simple data is, is, uh, is, is right in your face. So out of the abundance of the heart do things proceed from the mouth. So I hear you talking, and, and you keep saying the personal pronoun. I did it, I did it, I'm going, I did it. So Christianity is for you, only you. You, you want me magazines in the Christian in the church. Well, we're not supposed to have any me magazines in the church. That, that's called ah, wrong idea. The Bible says to think of others more than yourself. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Well, uh, those pronouns don't reveal that at all. And they come to me and they say, well, you, you don't want to hear personal pronouns, so you, you don't want to take care of yourself. You, you want to get run over by a train or something. And, 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 that's, what, and that's, that's, the only, that's the only retort the devil has. The only response he has is for us to, uh, we, we Protestant Christians, that, that we want to take up a cross every day. And the Christian faith is just for pain and sorrow. And, 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 you know, and, so, and so that gives them an excuse to be greedy and to hoard and to try to bring uh, the love of material things into a church and not love Father and just love material things. And they want to hang around. I just looked at that in Thessalonians, the great falling away. We're, we're right before the Antichrist comes, the, the Bible says that's what's going to happen. When everybody walks around and they're cold-hearted, even the ones who are going to church, they're very cold-hearted, they, they're, very, they're very selfish, and in the last days, it will be perilous times. Now, let's get off of that, because I don't want to spend that much time talking about that, but I had to mention that just a little, okay? In the last days, it will be perilous times. I want to talk about something positive right now and change the subject and talk about what is this saving faith for? Let, let's focus a little bit on that before we get into more criteria as to what is the saving faith. Let's stop for a moment and remind ourselves what we're looking forward to here. What's the goal here? And the goal is to make a person, by this Christian doctrine here, make them into a circumcised, caring individual. Speaking the truth in the concepts of your Bible. I just went over my beauty lesson. My beauty lesson has gotten big already, and, and that's good. It's going to take a lot of time. And it's going to be more work than I thought. But beauty is beauty. Number seven is the, is the core of this entire Bible uh, teaching here. Number seven. Uh, number seven is probably the core of the entire. I mean, you you, you could. I mean, there, there's no one core here, but uh, you, you might want to say that uh, number seven is is the big enchilada here. Yeah, you, you might want to say the the Fantastic Four. 
and the, the, the praise is great, and uh, number one, agape, and number three, the trifecta, and that's where this is all, that's what this is all about. The, the criteria for you to be a Christian and the, and the proper, enough, and sufficient terms that the master uses, uh, they deal with, they deal with the battle. They deal with 24. The battle for you to become an overcomer. However, that's, that's not, that's not the core of Christianity either. That's just remarking upon you being a successful lover of God. So if I identify you as being a successful lover of Jesus Christ, that's wonderful. But let's get into why it is wonderful. You notice, I don't want to spend that much time talking about how we get to heaven as what's going to happen when we get there. I think that's being left alone here. That's the point. Big time. That's one reason why a lot of people don't even necessarily want to be Christians because they, 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 no, no one's really given them some exposure as to what the value is here. What's the value? I had someone ask me the other day, uh, what's the value in all of this? You haven't told me the value. You, you keep telling me this and struggle or something and whatever, you know, and, and la di da di da Well, that's why I made number one agape in this ministry. Number one playlist in this ministry is agape. What is this high love? Why are we so excited about the love of Jesus? That's the number one lesson here. Now, you don't get to that high love until you get to number two and repentance and baptism, but that's not the point. Uh, I wanted to put number one for even Christians and even non-Christians. For everybody to, start to focus on what's the big prize here? What's the goal here? You know, and, and of course the big move now is to for us to turn the TV on and to, and to expect things from God. Right now, while you're on, while you're on this earth, that's not Christianity. That's secondary Christianity. The the, the prime. Uh, arena of Christianity is to expect to be with the one you love and, and, and rejoice in the love you have in your heart right now irregardless as to what you face and to what you do get and what you don't get all this talk about uh, uh, I'm the head and I'm not the tail and, and uh, no good thing will God withhold from me and all these scriptures that, 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 that people try to gather amongst themselves and, and, and heap together uh, in order to try to, to build something that can successfully uh, block soul salvation in living bread. It's not going to work here. We're sound doctrine Bible teachers. The core of our teaching is uh, one of the cores is number 11 here. Living bread. I'm going to eat denial. I'm going to eat humiliation scriptures. That's where we are again today. 80% of your New Testament is humiliation scriptures. I want you to humiliate yourself, and this is how you do it. 80% of the New Testament, over and over again. Get on your knees. Uh, confess your sins. Your transgressions uh, declare God His will, not your will, and that's the, that's the gist of Christianity. And anything else is dangerous. I don't even care if you use scriptures, because you can get some scriptures to give you the impression that you don't even need the uh, uh, the living bread. And and that's when Jesus told the devil. He told him what. You're going to die by eating the scriptures that give you the impression that God wants you to have some sort of luxury life and enjoy your life to the fullest. Even, even if you step on other people, who cares? Uh, the Bible tells you that you can do that. Let me show you some scriptures. And the devil showed Jesus some scriptures that gave, uh, that gave uh, uh, the impression that that might be the case. I'm a privileged son of God. What does that sound like? Turn your TV on, and that's what you're going to get. But it's not living bread. It's dead bread. You've got to eat the living bread. And what 
the master was telling the devil or anybody else who's listening is, I do indeed have commands for you to enjoy food and so forth. Uh, uh, Jesus didn't tell the devil that uh, I didn't say that. He didn't say, I didn't say that humans uh, can enjoy their, their life and, and plant food and enjoy the sunshine and, and, uh, and, uh, and rule over animals or something and all the scriptures that give you the impression that you have some sort of pleasure jaunt, you know, bonjour for you every day, you know. What's the word? Anna Tredi, I'm just trying to get another way of saying have a good day, you know, but Let's get back to the lesson, Jermaine. I just want to mention that, you know, we, we have to get back to square one, and I want to get back to square one for a moment before we get to uh, saving, not saving faith. What is saving faith and how people can experience some confidence in the Lord in their lives, especially in the 2,000-year uh, uh, area of Jesus Christ where the, where the Master prophesies in the parable of the sword to four people who've heard the gospel in one form or another. They, they heard about the gospel, they walked through the church, they went through some of the initial steps. As John said, they left us because they were not of us, and we're going to get into that later on. I want you to just relax, because I want to talk about the bottom line of, of why we are uh, uh, seeking, seeking to enter into the narrow gate and be the one of four people uh, who did, did things right. One out of four people in the parable of the sower, which is prophecy, because the Lord has just started this church of four people who heard the gospel, and that's the sower who went forth to plant. And he's planting human beings in the church. And he's planting them by the word of God, which plants you. That's what roots and grounds you so that you know where to go and what to do. And three people were, were uprooted, and they're gone. And they're gone for different reasons, but let me talk about the goal of why we want to be that one of the four guys, or four people, one of the four, why do we want to be that person? And what does the Master say to, uh, to enter in? Those are the words, enter in. Why do you want to be the one that enters in? I spent a lot of time on that in this ministry, a lot. Because I've been involved in seven ministries. I did say eight the other day. I've been involved in seven ministries in my life. I'm an older gentleman. I've been an assistant. Uh, I, I play a lot of music for the pastor. And I've hung around quite a few pastors in my days and Bible teachers. And well, not that many, just a, a few and uh, got to know them very well, and all of them were very nice uh, people, um, different types of... Uh, I didn't hang around the country western pastor very much. Well, that was in Riverside, California. I just saw a movie with Riverside in it. But uh, uh, I've been all over Southern California. Uh, I, I didn't know Pastor Chapel too much, the Baptist church in the high desert very well, but I did participate in some of the Bible lessons and the... Uh, in the uh, uh, home home lessons and so forth. And what I came away with was I didn't think there was enough teaching on the goal of Christianity, not so much as the battle, which is 24 on my, on my list here. We talk a lot about war here a lot because it, it is a battle. And we're here to equip you so that you win the battle. And you fight a good fight. And you win that fight. As a soldier of Jesus Christ. And, and the point is, is that I don't want to focus too much on the war. I want to focus on the prize of the war. That's what I want to focus on here. I focus on the prize here a lot. And the ministries I belong to, I don't think they spend enough time. We're obviously not putting the guys down. Uh, that I work with. Uh, all the guys I've worked with are very caring, loving, intelligent uh, people th that you, you'd want your daughter to, to uh, uh, marry, kind of guys. Okay, that's my point. But what's the goal here? 
let's talk a little bit about the goal and and what is the top idea here to get back into agape and the trifecta here. You know, the, the top tier. I made I made lesson number one and number three, basic two the basic two playlists that, that really define why we're here. What's the goal here? Well, I just worked on number nine here, which is new wine, and that's part of the goal too. Uh, 47 is, I call it Kool-Aid. Uh, that's a very important playlist that's coming up. So there are some very top issues here pertaining to what is the top of what we're, where's the cream of all this? What, what's, the, what's the really big goal here? Uh, let, me get, let me share a scripture with you. That that deals with that, and, and we don't want to we don't want to lose track of this. Okay. Let's go to Luke. Let's go to Luke five. Eighteen, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath He hath sent me. To heal the brokenhearted. Stop right there. Let, let's, let, let's take a look at that. God gave you the force. He gave Jesus the force. He gave me the force. The energy that, that's not mine. I have electricity that's not my, my electricity. It's Father's electricity. And that's what the Spirit means. To breathe the infusa, the breath of God. The same breath that created your soul. Let's continue. Because he hath anointed me to preach. Because. Let's stop right there. I have a new lesson called Because. And I'll get into that later. I also have a new lesson uh, that, I'm, I'm, that I'm formulating on abundance. There's a lot of work here. And that's for us to learn all together. Okay. Now. Because he hath, he hath anointed me. So the Spirit is on you, and the purpose is to anoint you to preach forgiveness and the gospel. That's what I preach here over and over again. And that's to the poor people. Rich people don't care about being saved because they're basically already saved. Why tell me to be saved when I'm doing very well on my own right now? That's the blessing of being poor in general. That's it. He hath sent me to heal. I think the other scripture says bind up. That's okay. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. So heal and bind are the same terms here. To heal the brokenhearted. We can't get away from this. We, we, and, I, and I'm going to remind you, those who are subscribers here, who are, are steady listeners who find the time that the Lord has allotted you to look at these videos, to remind you over and over again, especially in these 2022 videos, that we're here to primarily use all of this knowledge so that we might bind up the brokenhearted. And to set at liberty those who are captive. To preach deliverance to the captives. It's, it's worded a little differently in Isaiah, but it's the same. It, it's from that quotation from Isaiah. To set at liberty those who are captive or to preach deliverance to those. I, I, I can preach deliverance to you, but it, it's not going to do any good unless you drink the water. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. I've led a lot of people to the gospel, which, which sets you free. It's, it's a gospel of peace, and, and it brings peace to you and deliverance from your psychology, your, your psychosis. But you have to humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Otherwise, you, you, your, your, uh, your psychological status will, will remain on the ground and in, and in the mud and in the gutter. To preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind. And to set at liberty, to set at liberty 
they who, well, them that are bruised. People who are beat up by the world, people who have been captive by psychological uh, data and worries about the world and whatever, that's what we're here to fix. Okay? I'm going to come right back to this because this is, this is the goal of all of this. And I don't want some of you to get lost out there. And I'm not saying you are. I'm just saying that the goal here is to, to, to build a love recovery team. That, that's what we are. We're, we're a truth recovery team where someone walks up to us and they go, oh, I'm confused. Uh, and you go, well, well we, you know what? I have a fix for that. Okay, we, we can fix your problem. We can fix your breaks for you. you know, we, 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 we have the tools here. I have the equipment. It's the Word of God and the presence of God. Emmanuel, God is with you. I'll be right back as we finish up a, a, a look at this Isaiah quote, which is also in Luke uh, 5 there. Because this is the first thing the Master taught, essentially. It's about the first red letters in your uh, book of Luke here, uh, other than uh, the quotation uh, of, of Jesus telling the devil that, that, that man man's going to die if he doesn't fully submit to Father. You can't partially listen. You, you can't you can't play twister twister games. You can't. I want this over there. I don't want that over there. You, you're going to have to get into everything because the devil is playing. Uh, games right now. He, he, he's playing lawyer. Did I really do that? And then, oh, all that stuff. Instead of just admitting the truth. And the truth is, is that unless you fully submit to the Lord and you love Him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, there's no soul. You, you, we're not going anywhere. And the devil doesn't love God with all of his heart and soul, mind, and strength, so he's going to die too. Not just humans, but the person who's asking Jesus Christ, they're going to die. Because they're not willing to eat living bread. They're not willing to eat everything uh, in the valley of decision uh, in their life. They didn't eat it. They pushed it away from their table. I don't, I don't want to devour. I don't want to think about what you're telling me to think about. Because living bread means thinking. That's what it means. Okay? That's what it means. I'm going to think about this. When you think about something... You're more or less eating it. You're living off of that. That is your energy, what you're thinking about. And Jesus told the devil, he told the same thing to Peter, get behind me, Satan, because you don't have your mind on being a servant of Father. And that's a sure way to death. And I don't want to die. So get behind me because I don't want to die. Now, Jesus couldn't die, really, but his body, he, he didn't want his body to die. You serve the Father, you, you'll never see death. It's impossible for you to preach the gospel, love the Lord, and die. It's impossible. I see it on TV all the time where America turned into Babylon, where, where people when people die, they say they're dead. I watch the movies that say that, oh, Billy died, and... Uh, I'm sorry to hear that because you're trying to, to push on me when I turn my TV on and so forth, your values and how you see the world, and I don't see it that way. I see that when you die as a Christian, absent from the body, is present with the Lord. That's how I see it. Now you try to push on me all your ideas or whatever, and all I see is Babylon confusion. That's all I see. I, I don't live in Babylon. I don't live in Jericho. I don't know where you're living. I, I don't live there. So-and-so died. It's horrible. Well, it, 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 you might be sad because you miss them, but if, if they're born again, uh, it's not all that bad at all. Now, now I have to do a... Let me share it with you before we shut down. For this video, and this should be 2.3.4, something like that, 5.3.4. You, you know, we have to take time out to have a lot of correction 
because of the volume and the multitude that were facing the throng is huge now of people who have just been totally confused by their television and their computer and so forth. And, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, uh, on, on correction. Now, I have a, a lesson of correction. That's 26 uh, a playlist where I teach you how to correct people. And, we'll, and, I'll talk, uh, and I'll share with you a little bit about how God corrects people. That's in 26, correction. You know, how, how do you confront people? When do you confront them? And all that kind of all that, uh, stuff. Okay? But we have to we have to spend a lot of time on that. Now, if, if I were if I were a Quaker, excuse me, or if I were a Mennonite, or someone who doesn't deal with the world that much, my evangelism is small. The, the, that's one problem. That, that, that's a big problem with the whole Quaker, uh, Mr. Fox, who started the Quakers and and the Mennonite and the Amish people. That's one of the problems with being a Mennonite. Is you were called to occupy and not to get out of the world. You're not called to go into some monastery somewhere uh, in the mountains. That's not the general call of Christians at all. It doesn't mean you can't do it and, and, and God's going to be upset or anything. It's just that common sense tells you from a fourth grade grammatical perspective that Jesus said go into the highways. If you, if you go to a group over here hiding in the corner, uh, if that's not going into the highways. Once again, we're not putting them down. They're wonderful people. As a matter of fact, they're probably the most wonderful Americans to ever be Americans. But, but, but my point still remains that, that uh, Christianity is meant for you to get out there. And you, you, you're going to rub elbows with some with what we used to call, well, I don't want to say, people who are just bereft and challenged and they've listened to lies. And it's our job to get out there and, and, and Jeremiah was given a forehead of flint. I have a forehead of flint. I can buck heads with anybody. I was meant to do that. Daniel wasn't called to live in Babylon. He was called to live in Israel around a Mennonite Amish community. But it didn't work out that way. So God used him when he was surrounded like uh, anybody else is surrounded uh, in Sodom and Gomorrah and Babylon. Lot was surrounded. The Bible said he was vexed. That means he was constantly uh, being pushed into a filthy environment. That's part of what uh, Daniel had to deal with. When Joseph went to Egypt, same thing. When Jesus went to Israel, there's, there's another Babylon. Israel became Zerubbabel, another Babylon. In general. I'll be right back as we get back into Broken Hearted. I, I want to talk with them a little bit more before we go to Matthew 13, where, where I'm going to talk, share with you about saving and unsaving confidence and, and what happens to people who are confident and, 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 they, and they grab the truth and something happens. And we're going to talk about that. It's very serious, but I'm going to take my time and go through that. And we're just about done with uh, uh, saving faith. Uh, I have some more on saving faith I'm going to bring to you um, because it's going, to, it's going to be about five more videos or so to let you know. It's going to, this is going to get a little deep because we're dealing with core principles and the parable of the sword is, is one of the centers of your Bible. It is like core stuff. It's, it's like the parable of the gentleman, the gentleman who was forgiven a big debt. That's a big one. That's a big parable too. And when you get into Luke, you start getting into parables, and of course that's in Luke 14 and so forth. And uh, in these areas, that I'm not going to cite right now because I'm getting a little confused. I got too many numbers in my head. Jeremiah is on fire. We're going to shut down and, and close with Paul and Corinthians 16 area there. The end, oh, the end of the whole book. Maranatha. After you've said everything, let's just get out of here. And for those of you out there, if you're broken hearted, and uh, I'm going to talk about that when I come back. I want to give you an example of how, of what a broken heart is 
and boots on the ground Christianity. I don't do it too much, but I like to give examples every now and then and kind of get away from the, the, the textual. Um, we have Old Testament examples. I mean, we can use Hannah uh, big time. Um, we, we might talk about Hannah for a minute and, uh, and how she was confident that she was going to have a baby like all the other women, and she ended up getting a woman, a, a baby, a baby, uh, a baby boy. So we'll get into that a little later. A long video. I don't like going this long. That's okay. We, every now and then we have to go long, okay? We have to spread out because we, we're trying to talk about belief right now and confidence, persuasion, conviction, and promises, the promises of God. And, and we're trying to, to take our time and put some examples and to talk about what the goal of all of this persuasion is. That's what I want to talk about before we get back into Matthew 13, which is the path of persuasion, the good persuasion, the profitable persuasion, the prosperous persu persuasion. And, uh, and what's the goal here? You can't get away from the overarching ideas here, the big ones. And I want to give you an example of, of, of boots on the ground Christianity about Someone having confidence and having their confidence broken. Where you expect everything you expect everything that everybody else has, and that's not necessarily a bad deal. That's not it's not necessarily wrong for you to expect what most people have. A very large portion of Americans are married and they're happily married. Especially uh, the Mennonites over here. They have a 10% divorce rate, so they have a 90%. Uh, 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 everybody stays married and happily married ever after. You can turn your TV on. You can doubt in the command of God that thou shalt not commit adultery because there's 70% uh, a divorce in America. Well, that's that's a lie because there's a 70% divorce amongst people who don't have uh, an, uh, uh, an intellectual mind. Go over and hang around the Amish people and see what their divorce rate is. It's almost unheard of. See, where you are defines your reality. The, 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 you know, if, if, you're in, if you're in Las Vegas and Reno, Nevada, marriage can be shut down in two weeks. It's over. Uh, let's wrap it up. And people see that, and they get discouraged about love and devotion, so they think that having a warm heart and being devoted is something that they, they don't have to do, and it's a waste of time. So, so they use the wrong criteria to come to their conclusion as to what their heart should be doing uh, romantically. I want to talk about the heart a little bit more and how all this b belief that we have, that saving belief, it leads us to into being vulnerable, and being vulnerable is good. Having a heart that can be broken is, is excellent. That's what you want. Uh, uh, irregardless as to what may happen to that heart, uh, whoop de doo you, you want a heart. I want to talk about that. That's what all this Bible teaching is for, for us to develop a circumcised heart and a caring person uh, through the development of Jesus working on us and, and developing in, in us a very caring heart and a merciful, forgiving heart. One of the big goals here at the end of Matthew chapter 5, uh, we, we, we might talk about that again. I go over Ma the end of Matthew chapter 5 over and over again. Almost ad nauseum because it, 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 it's the big enchilada in the middle of Luke, the middle of Luke 6, right here where we are right here. I turn one page over here. Where it talks about a heart, it talks about forgiveness and, and being merciful and having a heart-to-heart -heart life, which is what the church is supposed to produce. And it will, for those of you who want to love the Lord, you will have that, that kind of heart where you press down and shake, press down and shake them together, uh, deep, true uh, devotion, you're going to give to the other party, the other person. They're going to give that same thing to you. 
That's called koinonia. That's living in the agape world of high intelligence and high love that comes from the throne of God. And you share that with other people in the church. And you can't beat this lifestyle. You can't beat it. It's like when I used to hang around lots of children in K through 12. I taught uh, students in, in K through 12, ages 5 to 18, uh, which is which is an adult, but uh, in their late teens, I taught them, and the younger the kids were, the more caring they were. Because the world has not infected them and has not made their hearts cold, and they're not proud, and all they really know is basically love. That's all they basically know, the young ones. They don't know how to scheme. They don't know how to use craft. They, they don't know anything about that yet. They watch their TV ad nauseum, and then, then they'll develop these skills and listen to rock and roll music or whatever. But I want to talk about that child mind and that child heart here as we focus on really the goal of Christianity here. And, and, and we really can't spend enough time talking about it. It also leads to beauty, too. I just took a, took a review of my lesson on I'm revising beauty for you, and it's amazing what the Bible talks about when uh, what beauty means. It's very deep. You see beauty out here, and you and, and I was told in school that, that that beauty came from like nowhere, you know, and so forth. That is one of the sickest things I've ever heard. Let, let me share something.